this his step number two it took me some time to think about to figure out why this was but it was try very hard to delete a part or a process and the sub item to that was if you're not occasionally adding things back in you're not deleting enough and i had to think about that one for a little while and i'm and i was like okay what does that even mean and i guess i interpreted it as that you know everyone thinks they have a process to get something done and they have to follow that process especially true if you're in any kind of government contract or or or, or government institution sure. you, you know you got to follow their process regardless if you're trying to run a lean shop i mean that stuff can get implemented sometimes with a bad good intention and and so I guess what your your former colleagues at SpaceX try to do is delete stuff up to the point where you pretty much can't do it anymore. And then you, know, <laughs> you need to add it back in, I guess. And so I was trying to think about how do I explain this to Spencer? And I was like, okay, so say it takes your process is A, B, C, D, E. You, you know, you're starting from A, you have to get to E. Well, what if you delete B? Can you still get to E? Okay, cool. Well, now let's maybe delete D. Can you still get to E? No, we can't. So then you got to add back, add D back in. Ah. Uh, it's kind of, that's kind of the way I was thinking about it. Like, you know, delete processes until you can no longer get what you're looking for. Then you realize you went too far. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Vinny Kemmler. Vinny is the Director of Hardware at Modal AI. They're a Qualcomm spin-out specializing in small unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, Vinny, great guy, second time on the pod. Thank you for coming on. Appreciate you very much. Praise Allah, and it's good to have you back. <laughs> Thanks, Marissa. Thanks for having me back for, of course, the second time. Um, it was kind of interesting. I was. It was only after... I had my first interview with you as your guest, where I then even thought to ask you, hey, where, where do you put these videos? I, <laughs> <laughs> I, what, we went, I went to that first interview with you completely blind, not knowing who you were, what we were going to talk about. Same, and honestly. I, like five I, minutes I, of LinkedIn I, research. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it came out okay, but what was funny was, you know, in the weeks after, I, would, I was watching a lot of your pods. Thank you. And... Uh, I was telling my wife how I'm like, oh man, I don't know how mine's going to do because all of this guy's podcast are like technical people talking about their work and some technical aspects and, you know, with a few things personal here and there. But I felt like like our interview was 90% personal matter. And I was like, oh no, I hope, I hope it's not going to be a terrible podcast. People don't even know who I am. And I'm, Yours I'm had some of the best life. viewership we've ever had, not to cut you off, but... <laughs> I think people like that stuff. So I wonder, I worry sometimes that like a lot of the content and articles and podcasts I release are too dry and technical, <laughs> like a little bit like, you know, like who, who is this for, but you know, some dweeb like myself. And so I, um, I mean, I honestly, it was refreshing just to talk to someone about their roots and car stereos and, you know, just kind of, I mean, that stuff is fun too. So I, I don't see an issue with any of that. Yeah, it was definitely fun, and uh, I made sure this time that my son's bath is was yesterday and tomorrow, not tonight. So nice. You know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try to plan it out where I'm not gonna, you know, we don't have to cut it off at six p.m. my time um, to do bath time. And so my wife was like, we we, we scheduled it accordingly. It's like okay, we're, so we should be good to go. Thank you. Um, and last time I promised you. Um, it was a little early for me last time, but I again made it the point. I'm gonna, you know, cheers to you. I, oh, I dude, bullet! Good. That's good stuff. I got the basil yeah, Hayden over I'm, here. Yeah, I told you I'm a bullet guy, and you can see it's almost always empty. Like, <laughs> I might actually have a thing of bullet if you give me a second just to run and check, okay. just so we see That's if we can sync up. Me. Yeah, That's give me, give me one sec. I'll, I'll pour one if I got one. Otherwise, I'll be drinking basil Hayden. Hold on one sec. Unfortunately, not in this office. It's it's at the other location, but uh, I'll join you for a neat whiskey regardless. <laughs> there you go. And a bourbon at that. 
That, that's some good stuff. I'll, uh, I'll pick a bottle of that up one of these days. It's honestly, it's pretty reasonable for what you get. I, I like it quite a lot. Cheers, Benny. Cheers, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Yeah, so I also uh, made sure I actually did my hair, put on a nicer shirt. <laughs> Yeah, I you look like good. I show up on your show like I just came from the gym. <laughs> and I'm wearing a t-shirt this time, like a schmuck. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I was like, Vinny was pretty was... informal last time. I'm just going to wear a t-shirt today. <laughs> yeah, so I was mentioning to you before you started recording how my CEO is actually offering to use our Twitter and Facebook feeds to, 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 to plug your show with me on it. Thank you. And I kind of almost don't want him to do the first one. <laughs> 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 so i made sure if it, okay if, if our customers watch this with me at least you know i come up a little more presentable and, and, and professional Makes sense. maybe i should put my sweater back on <laughs> you get dressed up here <laughs> but i'll tell you i, I learned um i learned some stuff watching your podcasts i thought it was really great i loved I got to learn about you, which is good. I think you're a great guy. And I Thank you very much. It. Likewise. I appreciate what you're doing for our community. Um, having, <laughs> letting us have a voice, letting us have a forum to just engage in kind of casual, cool conversation. There aren't that many lenses into what it's really like. And I think there's there this are. misconception that you've got to be invincible and, and you can't do any wrong as an engineer, or as a director, or an engineering manager, or VP of engineering, or whatever it may be. And, and the truth of the matter is everybody screws up. And especially if you're working hard on something that's never been done before, like you should be screwing up or you're probably not trying hard enough. And so what I've really enjoyed about making the show is, is just hearing people talk candidly about, you know, the stuff that advances the field. I mean, if, if you're not breaking things, you're probably not trying hard enough or, you know, really doing advanced work. <laughs> so. I mean, that's been really fun for me, and, and I appreciate the recognition there. Thank you. Yeah, and, you know, we also make mistakes as engineers, not just technically, but oftentimes socially. Of course. <laughs> um, and so I have a funny story. I'm actually glad, you know, we were supposed to do this a, a few weeks ago. It was actually kind of, in a way, kismet that we got delayed because the very next day, a funny story happened. That nice. I, I, gotta tell this, I have to tell this to Spencer. I'm listening. Um, so our company just did this big announcement with Qualcomm on our new drone platform called the RB5 Flight. Um, and because of that, we've been getting a lot of interest. And so I'm at work on, I think we were supposed to do our, our thing on Monday, right? Yeah. And so I'm at work on Tuesday. And this is, we announced it, I think on a Friday and I'm our, and I'm just doing some soldering for, I'm making a custom cable adapter for one of my uh, test colleagues. Nice. And I'm just sitting there doing some soldering. And then I see Chad come by with two guests uh, and show, kind of showing off our facility and, our, and, and doing tours. And I'm just sitting there soldering. And then they, they start walking behind me and I look up and I recognize that it's, um, Matt Grob, the former CTO of Qualcomm, and the one that basically started our project when we were at Qualcomm. <laughs> That's and awesome. Paul Jacobs, the former CEO of Qualcomm, who was there, who was CEO for about eight plus years. And I just look holy up and crap. I go, I look up and I go, holy shit, it's Paul Jacobs. Badass. <laughs> 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 and he looked back down at me and smiled, and I'm like, I'm like, wow, I'm like, welcome to Modal, and that's awesome that you're here. I mean, this, you know, keep in mind, this... You Did know, you say that out loud where he could hear you? I said that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, like, he smirked a smile, you know, did a little smirk. And I was like, wow. And I was just, I thought it was hysterical. Like, here is this guy. He's probably worth three, four, five hundred million dollars walking right behind me. And, and I, I had mentioned, I kind of said, wow. And I said to him, like, wow, you were my favorite CEO of Qualcomm. Because, you know, the bulk of my tenure there was under his leadership and i thought yeah. it was awesome and then it was just like he was like well thank you i appreciate that and then so then chad just kind of continued on with his tour and they were just talking about drones and robotics and what they're because you know they're doing their own thing now that you know they 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 started their own company you know paul did and i was talking to chad afterwards i'm like wow what were they doing here that'd be great if we can collaborate you know work on some projects together so that'd be kind of cool so who knows which i just Good thought luck. it was funny that like 
I just like, okay, I have to tell this to Spencer. I just thought it was so funny. Like, not everything is as professional as you try to be. And as, yeah, of course, as, you know, sometimes I, you just, I got like engineer, like, they, you know, they say starstruck. Yep. I got like engineer struck, right? That's cool. So just like, like, you know, it's kind of like meeting like Elon Musk, right? It's, I, it's I've, like I've met Elon Musk. <laughs> so. Yeah. You worked at SpaceX. Yeah. <laughs> I would imagine you have. I mean, briefly, like very, very, he, he wouldn't know who I am. Right. But it's, it's been similar. Like, like, holy shit, it's Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said that with him within earshot, but I mean, he gave a company-wide talk when I was an intern there, and I was only an intern. I didn't work there in a serious capacity, but I remember, um, you know, somebody asked, what was it like starting SpaceX? And it was basically Q&A, and, and he was like, well, you know, we went to Russia, and we looked at buying these Satan missiles, is what they called them, and it was an ICBM. <laughs> And they wanted to send two of them to Mars. They had redundancy, and they wanted to put a biodome on Mars, and um, and and that was the thing, right? It was it was like we'll set up this biodome, we'll get a photo, and it'll be a great money shot. He uses that word with the press all the time for that experience. Money shot. Money shot. Over and over, he'll say money shot, money shot, money shot. <laughs> and so um, anyway, so I, I remember hearing him say that, and my I'm a smart ass, right? So like my immediate reaction, and I'm wearing I heart haters T-shirt, and I hat that says Compton like Easy used to wear in the 90s and <laughs> I'm an intern so like, yeah pick me pick me and you know he's like fine like after like six minutes he's like fine you what, what do you want to say you <laughs> the stupid annoying ones. yeah exactly no, really, <laughs> the high maintenance really intern really yeah. <laughs> and I'm like uh Mr. Musk what was it like trying to um buy missiles from the former Soviet Union <laughs> <laughs> He's like, well, we went and bought these. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I want to know, was it some shady back alley shit? Were you talking to generals? Like, what? And he's like, oh, it was very above board. <laughs> so I was that guy. <laughs> I, uh, that, that was the one time I met Elon Musk. <laughs> of course, you ask him the uncomfortable question. I, I wanted to put him outside his comfort zone. I mean, it's still doing that to this day, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, not that long ago, Chad, my CEO, put out this email to my, my boss, Ray, and I. You know, he runs the hardware, uh, overall hardware efforts, you know, building, dealing with this crazy supply chain right now. Amen to that, and brother. I, I appreciate Chad because, you know, he knows Ray and I are extremely experienced. You know, Ray was also at Qualcomm for 20-something years. He's got, you know, close to 30 years overall experience. And Chad is good at, like, um, make sure we stay fresh and stay current. And so the other day he That's actually awesome. emailed us a... There's a video out there of Elon talking about like how do you get things to production and scale efficiently and quickly and accurately. And he says, Hey, why don't you guys just take a look at this? He's like, obviously I know Elon's controversial, but there's no doubt, you know, he knows how to get results on, on scale. Yeah. Hmm. And so I thought it was kind of cool. Um, and so the funny thing is I actually have a cheat sheet of that that bullet list on my other screen here. That, that'd be kind of cool technical stuff we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the, the points that Elon had on that? I'd actually be curious. I know he's all about vertical integration, just from working for the guy. Yeah, so his first rule is if anyone's been an engineer for any number of time, you know the senior engineer is always telling you what are the requirements, what are the requirements. They're always, you know, hounding. Like the first time you'll, in, you're, you'll be in any kind of meeting with any senior level technical person is almost always going to say, well, what are your requirements? And I think it's funny how that's Elon's first point is, you know, make your requirements less dumb. <laughs> His point I thought was funny was that it's all requirements are definitely dumb. You know, you got to make them less so. And they're particularly dangerous if a very smart person gave them to you. <laughs> Why is that? I guess the way that I interpret that, the more specific your requirements are, the more pigeonholed the designer gets. And it kind of squashes some of the creative freedom to be able to solve a problem in a different way while still meeting requirements. I agree. Uh, think of like think of the different think of like, okay, make a rocket to go to the moon. Think about that as a requirement compared to Make a rocket that's 168 feet tall, can carry this payload, and is this the diameter? And you know, think about as you get more and more specific, 
you're constraining potential solutions that wouldn't necessarily have been thought of the first time somebody thought of those requirements because they've got a solution in mind and they're basing their requirements off of what they think would solve the problem. Exactly. But the issue is maybe that's not the best solution. And so, exactly. okay, I see what you're saying. And like right now I'm, I'm working with a customer that's saying, you know, use this particular regulator, please. You know, this is what we qualified. I'd like you to use this particular regulator. And well, we're having a hard times getting it in this current supply chain. Yeah, uh, that, issue. that makes a lot of sense. I mean, like, well, we're having a really hard time getting it. So I, I you know, I have these back and forth. This is a pneumatic companies. regulator or an electrical regulator? Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I know you have a wide variety of, 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 of guests and stuff. It's for electrical. I'm Got it. Electrical DC to DC a converter? Vol a voltage regulator. Got it. Um, yeah, linear regulator, low dropout linear regulator. Okay, I'm, um, now you're speaking my language. Well, yeah, low, low, yeah, exactly. Low noise. Um, <laughs> and so I'm trying to like say, okay, can we just open up, you know, how about other ways to solve this problem? And I think that's, it's good that this customer is flexible and they're willing to work with us on, you know, okay, maybe not this specific one, but let's try to find ones that can meet what we're trying to do. And that's kind of a sense of like make the requirement less dumb. Yeah. In a way, making it less specific as well. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So the second one. I try to do that too, by the way. Sorry, not to cut you off. I apologize. No, you're, for that. you're fine. Yeah. I think we had we went through this before. We cut each other off. That's my 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 uh, one of my weak one of my weaknesses is I Same. tend to get over anxious and excited and want to inject into the conversation. Apparently, that's like a Jewish thing to do. Is what one of my fellow engineers was telling me. He's like, no, no, no. It just means you're excited for the next part of the talk. <laughs> you like the conversation so much that you want to get the next part of it. And I already know what you're gonna say. Just let me say so I can save. I can save us both the time and effort. Right? Let me just exactly. <laughs> the other one. This his step number two. It took me some time to think about to figure out why this was, but it was try very hard to delete a part or a process. And the sub item to that was if you're not occasionally adding things back in, you're not deleting enough. And I had to think about that one for a little while. And I'm, and I was like, okay, what does that even mean? And I guess I interpreted it as that, you know, everyone thinks they have a process to get something done and they have to follow that process, especially true if you're in any kind of government contract or, 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 or government institution, sure. you, you know, you got to follow their process regardless. If you're trying to run a lean shop. I mean, that stuff can get implemented sometimes with a bad, good intention. And and so I guess what your, your former colleagues at SpaceX try to do is delete stuff up to the point where you pretty much can't do it anymore. And then you, know, <laughs> you need to add it back in, I guess. And so I was trying to think about how do I explain this to Spencer? And I was like, okay, so say it takes your process is A, B, C, D, E. You, you know, you're starting from A, you have to get to E. Well, what if you delete B? Can you still get to E? Okay, cool. Well, now let's maybe delete D. Can you still get to E? No, we can't. So then you got to add back, add D back in. Ah. Uh, it's kind of that's kind of the way I was thinking about it. Like you know, delete processes until you can no longer get what you're looking for. Then you realize you went too far. That's, that's interesting. So you want to basically get down to like the minimum viable process, as it were, and, and yeah. the barest bones you can find. And, and when you've got that, it's it's as sparse as can be, and you're you're doing all right because now you've got flexibility to solve your problem. And and I like a lot of your podcasts you've done before. You've a lot of your guests have been involved in startups. And I think it's that generic startup nature. A little budget constraint. <laughs> yeah, to not follow the rigor and process of the company you left and bring it over and slow you down. Like you want to say, okay, what do I need? Two to of them, I think, came done? from Caterpillar, by the way, separate podcasts, different stuff. Yeah, I, I really like that interview because yeah. my wife knows the CEO of Caterpillar. That's cool. Um, That's really cool. And was, the, were you talking about Brad or, or Nyastia, yeah, Anna? What's that? You're talking about Brad or Anna? Because both of them left Caterpillar to start their startups. No, no, she, she knows Umpleby, the CEO. That's badass. But what I what I mentioned was the the podcast you saw. I had two podcasts with former Caterpillar people that started oh. the company. Oh, I think so I one was Brad Cryol and one was Anna Kraft. Brad. Okay. Brad was the one I remember. I was, yeah. I was thinking of that one. Um, so Anna started a company that makes uh, fashionable work boots for women. Brad yes. makes, uh, just for people that haven't seen the podcast, uh, they're like chop saws with an auto set feature where it'll slide your, your stock in a certain amount. 
I didn't so. realize Anna was also a caterpillar when I saw that podcast. I think that was that was good. That was actually that made me think of uh, when I was at Raytheon. They would have the uh, work boots truck come once every quarter. People <laughs> get work boots. Yeah, and it was exactly as she said. They're all just like the same style. Like yeah, there was no them. credence given to fashion. It's like an autistic yeah. person designed them. <laughs> I mean, that's controversial, but. I mean, we're all a little bit autistic in engineering, but at, at the end of the day, right? I mean, it's there's no credence given to design or fashion, or I mean, not even a whole lot to functionality. It's just like, does it stop a thing from breaking your foot? All right, it's a good work boot. Yeah, and uh, so I I think it's kind of I like the really, again another reason why I like your podcast is just because they are relatable. You know, you know, not just me being in the tech field, but just my personal experiences and observances it's like it's kind of cool to see the people that you have on are relatable thank you um so hopefully i meet that i continue to meet that trend as well. i think so yeah i mean yours was fun too you outed me as a gun owner i mean which nobody had done before on the podcast so. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to later you told me you recently went to the range though so. uh, i actually didn't get to go unfortunately uh, um I, I always go i mean just I'm such a workaholic I, I always go with people from work when i do anything when I go to the bar to grab, you know, drinks or when I go to the range to shoot guns or, you know, I mean, if I were into roller coasters, I'm sure it'd be the same thing. But I mean, pretty much everything I do for fun, I, I do with people I work with because then I, I'm kind of killing two birds with the same stone. And, you know, it's it's fun, but I'm also checking off the box of like I'm networking. Right. And so I can, I yeah, can say yeah. I'm doing both. And so um, everybody I invited um, the guy by insurance off of. Um, a sales executive from a company I'm not going to mention. And um, those are the people I was meant to go with. And the sales executive, um, the reason I'm not going to mention the company is because they were liquidating their sales department because they're running low on money. Mm. And so he was on the chopping block. He didn't get fired. He, he stayed because he's very good at his job. But um, his uh, director got canned. And, uh, you know, like a lot of people, a lot of people did, and, you know, he goes, Spencer, that's my teammate. I'm really stressed right now. I can't go shooting. I'm sorry. And yeah, yeah. the guy by insurance off of Stu goes, Spencer, I need to go to the range. <laughs> like it's stressful. Oh, no, this will make it better. <laughs> it's, it's funny to see. When, yeah. When I was in, um, when I was at Qualcomm, we actually formed the shooting club there to promote cool. gun safety. Uh, that's among. awesome. Yeah, you because know, we recognize the fact that, you know, it was a growing company, a big company. There is going to be a ton of gun owners in a company, regardless of the company's overall political sense. I believe that. Um, there are going to be people that are going to become gun owners. And what we felt it was our obligation to do was to um, make sure that those that were new knew how to do so safely. And we always found that there were a lot of people that when after the range, they were like, oh, my goodness, I feel so much better. I was so stressed. I was so <laughs> nervous. <laughs> This is a great way to just reduce stress and relieve stress, and, and it really is. I shot an Uzi in Indiana one time, and it was fully automatic, and it actually holds a way tighter grouping than you would imagine. Oh, wow. um, it, it, for those who don't know, it's an Israeli submachine gun that's about like this long, like it's not very big. And so you'd think it's it's like you see like in a hip hop video, like a Mac 11, where it's all over the place, and you know you're barely hitting your target. But the fact of the matter is, it's really well designed. You're you're on target. It's very heavy, so it it combats muzzle climb kind of naturally. And so I, I you know I, I made a pretty good grouping. And uh, there was this guy. I was in Indiana, and he goes, "Hey, hey, cheaper than therapy, isn't it?" <laughs> <laughs> it's, I remember th I've been to a lot of uh, uh, range instructional places where the the instructors say much cheaper than therapy. People they're like trying to like oh, I don't want to shoot all this ammo. It's like thirty dollars a box or forty dollars a box. Like yeah, what does a therapy session cost you? <laughs> <laughs> Hundred bucks easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't been more than three boxes. Texas. Yeah, yeah, I'm, nice. I'm, I'm itching to go a little bit. I haven't been since not close to two years ago. Uh, I still go if I'm being honest. My, my therapist is awesome, though. He was the staff philosopher for a design firm here in Pittsburgh. And so I actually got into this in episode two um, because the guy I had on knew my therapist as the staff philosopher from design firm where he started his career in engineering. <laughs> the first session I had with this guy, he goes, oh, you, you own an engineering consulting company. I can introduce you to the CEO of X company. I'm like, this is the guy for me. <laughs> <And> so... <laughs> 
you know, it's kind of a match made in heaven and 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 he, he's really awesome i mean he kind of preaches stoicism and i mean he's he's more a philosopher than he is a therapist which is kind of interesting to see he's been on joe rogan's podcast promoting his book um his name's andy norman he, he's great um he's not actually a therapist he's a philosophical counselor but i mean it serves the same purpose so i call him that yeah, yeah. um but great dude uh, i just talked to him today um he, he's awesome for me but I also respect not doing it since sexist. I mean, sometimes I wonder, am I pissing away money? Yeah. 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 Um, so I think the, uh, the other thing that we were uh, talking about, so the, going back to the Elon Musk thing was, you know, after step two, the third step was this simplify or optimize. And it was very important to say that that's not your first step. Your first step in any process shouldn't be to optimize it. You know, it's, it's going to be, you know, something that you do later. And he says, this is where a lot of smart engineers fall into this trap of trying to optimize something that shouldn't exist. <laughs> that's too, right? Well, it's if, if tunnel vision. You, yeah. If, if you didn't delete something that shouldn't exist, don't try to optimize it. Right. Yeah. You know, if it shouldn't I agree exist, with you. It shouldn't exist. So. Uh, but that doesn't, that takes more of a manager or a director mindset than an engineering mindset. You have to look at the big picture, which, I mean, there's big picture people that are stupid and full of crap, but at the same time, yeah, there's, you kind of, you got to kind of be willing to switch, right? You got to be willing to look at it from the 30,000 foot view and then, and then zoom in and, and be right there and, and vacillate because neither one is a hundred percent right or good for every single circumstance. Yeah, so I've always liked, um, that's why I love one of the things that I do is, you know, as, as a hardware designer, I also try to take the approach of a systems designer, like where does this hardware play into the system? And so that when someone is asking for, you know, how do I do this? You, I can give a more educated response back. Because if I'm aware of the system, then I'm aware of maybe they going back to that other step, you know, maybe they didn't give me the right requirements, or maybe they're they're understating or overstating what they need. And I can propose an alternate solution. Um, so that's always, I like, you know, that's, I like when I'm working with people that also have that same viewpoint capability where they can, they know not what just to optimize, but how let's just look at this from a different angle and start over again. You know, don't optimize something that shouldn't exist. Agreed. Um, so I think that, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and I've had to pull people out of that trap. Too. And I'm sure you have too, given what you do, where you see somebody optimizing something that you know maybe doesn't need to exist and you're like you know dude come on like or you know like come on definitely at the bigger firms and i would say and you probably you know with your all your guests that have been in startups when when you're in a startup there's a lot less of that believe it or even not. in a startup though, i think you get trapped sometimes like you know it's i think it's when you get laser focused on something it's kind of a mental exercise right you're just like i need to optimize optimize out you go down the line, you're just trying to optimize every point, but you're going about it sort of from the pipeline of the existing process rather than looking at, you know, the, the systems level and you're like, okay, the system is stupid. <laughs> if I eliminate the step, then, you know, maybe I can optimize something that actually needs to be there. And then that's a good optimization. And so, yeah, I, I've, I've caught myself quite a few times, um, doing an electrical circuit schematic, adding in extra little, oh, it'd be good if I can test this or put this mode in or provide this option for software, even though they didn't ask for it, I'm going to give it to them. Yeah. And then getting to That's the point awesome. later on where I realize, I think I'm doing a little too much for them. Let me pull this back out. This is getting too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> like, so you be awesome. sometimes. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I do think like clients and, and colleagues appreciate when you give them an extra feature. Yeah. But I mean, you're right. If you give them feature, they really didn't want, didn't ask for, and don't need. That's that's a horse of a different color. So. Yeah, yeah. Just I always. What's good is, you know, I I own the schematics, so I get to um, really kind of sneak in, as you call, like Easter eggs or. Yeah, it sounds like you've got that, pretty low level what you do, which is yeah, cool. Yeah, things that you know maybe people didn't think about or or ask for that I know should be there or. I want to be there or I'm given, I know my software engineer hasn't asked for it, but he's going to need it. <laughs> I've had people add their initials into the middle of 3d prints. We're like, no one will ever see it. That's the Easter egg. I, I used to do that at my first job. We, nice. would, we would put our uh, initials in the copper. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, that's kind of cool. But Somebody now, designed weird like, Lord boner Hitler underneath a connector. <laughs> this is just in school, but it was like an early PCB. <laughs> 
I, I bet you every every young engineer that, that that does something tangible, like we were talking about this before the pod started, and when you're making something and you can see your work product turn into product, you, you get that excitement of saying, hey, I, I did that. That was mine. It's like a graffiti artist, I feel like, where you're yeah. just like, I, I was here. <laughs> and then the next time you do that, you realize, wait a minute, I can mark this up with my name. <laughs> <laughs> And, it's like, it's and then the like, next time you're like, maybe I don't need to. Like, I've done that yeah, already. Yeah, I've done enough of these. I'm just, I'm proud enough of what it does and I can leave it at that. Yeah, now I just try to make sure that my company name gets the recognition. I don't care about it. it doesn't, it's not about me, you know? Yeah, and that's how I, it's easy to say when you own the business, I guess, from my perspective, yeah. but I don't know. Um, so the last step that they were saying was to, after you've, you know, made the requirements less dumb and deleted as much as you could and simplified and optimized. Now you can accelerate your cycle time. Um, you know, the idea is if, if you are digging your own grave, don't dig it faster. <laughs> so that, that's, that, so like once you've figured out your process and you got it optimized, now you try to figure out how do you make it faster? And then at that point, your last step is then at that point to automate. And I think that's, um, you know, a lot of people make the mistake of trying to automate early when they don't even have their design finished Yeah. or they're still trying to figure out what it's trying to do. And I've been guilty of that as well, where I used to do a lot I mean, of- Elon's been guilty of that with the Gigafactory, right? So of I mean, course, we all exactly. have, yeah. yeah. Um, I really loved, and, and I know one of your other podcasts talked about the tool called LabVIEW. Yeah, and, I've used LabVIEW uh, a decent amount. I love LabVIEW because it's a combination of, you know, electrical engineers, best friend, along with the, being a little bit of a software engineer, thinking about algorithms and how things are supposed to work in what order and what sequence. That's a very succinct way of looking at it. And I used to try to find excuses to use LabVIEW. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. <laughs> and I remember there was this one project I did where I was, um, we were trying to mimic uh, for non-engineer people don't realize that when you, your, your cell phone signal comes from a, a base station and it gets to your phone, it's constantly being interfered with. Uh, it's constantly changing. It, it's the, the link between the cell phone tower and your phone is what they call, in systems engineering terms, they call it the channel. And the channel is dynamic. It's always changing. There's always different levels of interference, weather, Different you know, paths, obstacles, you know, people, trees, buildings, whatever it is. And so one of my projects, which was cool, was the, the very smart systems engineers were I was tasked with putting together a piece of hardware to make a channel emulator so that when you're testing cell phones in a lab, you have a more realistic sense for what the radio link conditions are going through. And the first thing I said to myself was, okay, how can I use LabVIEW on this project? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, they're going to need to switch between an ideal antenna, a, you know, an antenna that goes through the channel, and then maybe something else. So the first thing I did was design a little uh, electro electronic switch controlled by LabVIEW where they just press the button they want in the LabVIEW GUI, uh, user interface, you have to, to select this, which yeah. one they want. And then I said, like, okay, cool. Now that we got that under on the control, let's make the channel emulator. <laughs> <laughs> Been there. I yeah. just thought it was kind of funny. No, similar, right? Like, I mean, a lot of times I'll, I'll paint something before I finish designing it, right? And I, yeah. I feel like that's, you want it to be awesome and pretty and, and you might want to practice a skill you, you could be better at. Like for me, I'm not that great at painting or you know, maybe you want to get better yeah, at the lab. You look. I don't know if that's your motivation. I, I, I've caught myself being guilty of, you know, don't polish the headlights before the engine's working kind of thing, right? You know, they don't put the, what do they say? Don't put the cart before the bus. I just so did that yesterday. I, I, I cleaned my car. I did a detail before I changed my oil, which was due for a change. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you just can't help yourself trying to cherry pick the fun tasks first. Yeah. Which is like, yeah, I want to see that shine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, when, when you get to control a lot of your work product, it's, you know, who's to say if you're not, if you're having a bad day, it's like, I don't want to work on that today. I'm going to work on this instead. It's just much more fun. And I know it's not the crux of what has to get done, but 
it'll eventually have to get done. And as long as I still meet the end goals, I'm going to do that today because it's more fun. <laughs> yep. And I love doing, um, you mentioned earlier about the artistic aspects and engineering, how there's not a lot of it. And that's Thanks. one of my favorite things to do is actual schematic work, the schematic drafting. Me too, honestly. Like, I mean, it's, and it's refreshing to meet somebody that's at a director level position that enjoys working the low level like that. Always, you, you can't lose sight of the, the low level. And when I was at um, two big companies in the past, it was kind of always that anecdotal, you know, the more they promote me, the less I get to do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I always said, I, I always felt like I'd, I had a bad day if it was just all meetings and just talking about stuff and not actually hands on, like, engineering yeah and those are the best days you know it's like yeah. those are the best best days well especially when you look at what you accomplished during that day later and you say how the heck did i do that or like you know like who that that wasn't me who designed that thing you know <laughs> I, i've looked at some of my past work and i've just been like how the hell did i get in that i wouldn't be able to do that now like how did i do that like of course i, I would I'm, but yeah yeah. I mentioned that last time, I think I was with you about my schoolwork, how I went back one day and opened up my project reports and I couldn't even read them anymore. I was like, how do I even do this? I don't even remember that math. That math looks funky to me now. I just, <laughs> just to think that I put together these reports and did all these calculations and simulations and it's mind boggling. But yeah, it's good. I like to stay, you know, get my hands dirty, as you say. That's the yeah, it's important. And the great thing I love about working at Modal is that yeah, I'm director of hardware engineering, but I'm also the key hardware designer. Um, it's awesome. So pretty much all except for a few pieces of that of the hardware that we sell have been my designs. Um, in particular, that RB, that Qualcomm RB5 flight drone, um, pretty much all but one piece of hardware in there is mine. Um, cool. What do you mean you actually designed the schematic for it? Yeah, so I designed the schematics. I'll, I'll, I'll do the layout with the layout engineer, or in some cases, small cases, I'll do it myself. If it's a small design and I have the time to do it, um, you know, I manage, I work with my, my boss who will help make sure it gets built and fabricated correctly. Uh, then I'm responsible for testing it, making sure it works. You know, if there are problems, figuring out why or where and getting it, getting it fixed. And so I just love, you know, um, it's, those are like my designs, like, you know, from the ground up and I just, I, I that's love awesome. That. You can be proud of that. I mean, you always will yeah. be, and you should be. Yeah. Like last time we talked about the Mars helicopter. Yeah, the Ingenuity I helicopter, felt, right? I felt unprepared, and this time I came prepared to show you the board. Oh, badass! And so this is the board that, uh, in this case, it's- How many layers is that? Uh, sorry, I'm close to the mic. How many layers no, that's is that? Fine. This, is, this was actually, I believe, a 10-layer board. Badass. Um, and this one, a colleague of, at Qualcomm and I, we, you know, we kind of co-designed this, so I can't take all the credit. Um, but this was the, this is the thing that's on the Ingenuity helicopter. This board, you know, JPL heavily modifies it. They probably remove all the connectors they're not going to use, and uh, you know, so it's you know, here's the um, you know the main Qualcomm chip and memory and so the I fact that those. Thing. I mean, it, it's honestly it's kind of refreshing to see that because I feel like I could see that in a terrestrial application. Like it's not so inaccessible that I feel like I couldn't I couldn't wrap my mind around yeah. certain parts of it. I mean, obviously I can't, I've never designed a chip and, you know, certain things, but it's a beautiful piece of engineering and, you know, it makes you feel more like, you know, maybe we're not all that different. Yeah. And to give some context, I'm going to promote myself here, a business card, <laughs> your viewers some concept of how big this actually is compared to a standard business card. Wow. Um, and you can see, this is, this is what's in That's you know, awesome. ingenuity right now. And the density on that's incredible too, that you've got those two large ships and they're right adjacent to each other. Cause you don't see that very often. Yeah. All of our, a lot of our designs are pretty much like that. I actually have some other uh, boards in front of me that I could show you as well. If we get sure. to those comments, I don't want to just blindly show you, you and you uses all these circuit boards and, and for them, but as, as, as it may come up, I can certainly have some show and tell now. I'd be interested to see. Um, I, I was in the Bay Area, uh, not to read, it was 2019, so like two years ago, but uh, I was hanging out with a friend and he goes, I always dominate show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's pretty hilarious. Yeah, I, 
it's nice now. Um, like one of our customers, we were trying to show them something on our current product, how to do something. And I'm like, you know, why don't I just lift up the board and show you in the camera? It was just so much. I didn't even think it's like a, how useful it is just to have something in your hands to even just to kind of guide a customer through something. You know, if it can't be on, you know, this whole coronavirus has really killed a lot of, you know, the face-to-face -face meetings where you get very productive. Yeah, I agree. And so the alternative is I always keep now a lot of these sample boards and a pair of tweezers. So I can just kind of point to something. <laughs> to the customer. No, this thing right here, that thing, you know. <laughs> That's also very dense. That's that's an awesome board as well. What what does that one do? Oh, so this one, um, this is our current voxel that Moto AI sells. Cool. Um, so this is this is um, so here was you can see size comparison. That was this is the one that's on the helicopter. Here's what we currently sell now at Moto AI, our voxel platform, and this goes into a lot of different uh, robotics and drone applications, and we're very proud of this. Um, you know, we this is, design is actually quite old. So How many layers is that one, just for perspective? This one is twelve. Okay, uh, cool. 12 layers. Um, what uh, and I, I'm embarrassed. I don't know, but what it, what does voxel actually mean? I've heard that acronym so many times. Well, so it's actually a play on a real thing. So VOXL is voxel is actually a trademark that we that we have Moto AI, um, but there is in um, geometric space a thing called a voxel V O X E L, and it's basically you know on like cameras and LCDs you have pixels. Yeah. So a pixel is a 2D space to represent a color. Correct. Um, what, what a voxel is, the V-O-X-E-L, is a 3D pixel, effectively. Interesting. So if someone is doing... Um, Not 2.5D. So it's, it's actually a, it's a, it's a true 3D pixel that has three-dimensional space aspects. Badass. Space coordinates associated to it. And it's important when... You know, you do applications that do, you know, a lot of AI and sensory type perception applications. Are you going to build a 3D map of your surroundings? Because if, if you're trying to build an autonomous drone to fly through a room or fly through a forest or, or complete a mission for a soldier, it needs to perceive all of its surroundings in 3D space. And when you build these maps using the cameras and this AI, all these AI algorithms, those kind of points in 3D space can be referred to as a voxel. Okay. And so, and so it's like the, it's the amalgama amalgamation of all the points in 3D space collected by your, basically your piece of yeah. equipment. So you can almost okay. think of it as a 3D coordinate. Okay. But a, a coordinate a system, a bunch of coordinates. Yeah. But a, a computerized, like, you know, uh, I don't want to use too many technical words to throw off all your viewers, but it's basically a point in 3D space. So it's not a coordinate yeah. system to take a step back. It's a coordinate. Okay. It's a coordinate um, that represents a, a point in space. And so that when a, a, an AI algorithm is trying to compute, let's say, an autonomous flight path, you know, from here to, from, from A to D, <laughs> from here to there, um, it, it knows what to avoid. It'll place does, its own center coordinates away from, from those. Does it matter what the base frame is or is that irrelevant? Well, it depends on the application. There's, there's okay. a thing in robotics perception type algorithms called ground truth. Um, and obviously, if you're outside and you're relying just on your barometer, let's say, to tell you your altitude above ground, you know, Maybe you don't care about the ground truth if you're relying on your barometer, but there are some cases where, especially if you're in, like, let's say, a two-story building, and you're and you think you're three feet above ground, but now you fly out a window, you're not three feet above ground anymore. And so, so these aspects of ground truth versus your height above your reference plane can come into play. So, ground truth, just to make sure I'm tracking correctly, and and this is a term I've heard but I've never fully understood, so this is helpful for me is basically like an assumption yeah does the robot or does your ai device really know where ground actually is and it's so little ground, ground usually meaning like the floor like the, the like the earth ground not, not yeah, yeah. electronic potential not ground, not like electronic earth ground but like like the plane like the of, of the of yeah yeah got it okay. like your local horizon you know like what is the actual where is the ground because it's kind of like you know picture an airplane coming in for a landing yeah um, and i've heard that term a lot from my friends in the self-driving car industry which is where i really i, I know it from 
and and they need that too and so that that makes sense so if you don't know your altitude go to window your altitude is wrong or or maybe relative to where the ground plane is at where you're at it's wrong like you think this is the ground plane your barometer tells you you're here but you're like oh yeah this must be the ground plane because i'm assuming it is no it ain't i'm down here you know okay yeah your barometer will get thrown off by weather right that you're you're the, the pressure at your local area um, yep. whereas all self-driving or autonomous vehicles y- you can bet there's a camera that has some view of the ground um, they all have some camera that has enough of a viewing angle or is tilted to make sure they can observe ground um, and, and that helps them with their algorithms for any kind of autonomy um, because again, like as you're coming in for a landing, you know, the air under the propellers changes density as you get closer and closer to the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of it times, does. if you have like a DJI or any of those older drones, and you do an automatic uh, landing sequence, if you're if you're perceptive, you'll notice the propellers will actually change a little bit of pitch right when they're about to land on the ground. Would the pitch is blacked on those. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, because it's it's just because the the barometer doesn't change fast enough in a difference of six inches where it's most critical to land per se. Um, so it's kind of like, it's trying to figure out how it does. That's why like a drone will come in kind of fast. And as it gets to the ground, they try to really slow it down. So it can really figure out where ground really is and no one is down. And then it can turn off its propellers. Fast. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of stories I heard where the propellers just stop spinning when it's still a foot up the air. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it or vice yeah. versa, they never turn off. It thinks it landed, or it doesn't think it's landed, and it's still trying to go down, and it it's already down, and the propellers don't stop. You know, it makes a lot of sense to me. And that's a safety issue, right? Of um, course. So, um, yes, yeah, there's a lot of cool sensors that go on these. It's like you can accomplish with a kill switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, it's, I've been getting to use some of the uh, um, some of the software utilities that our team uses that does the test flights and. A lot of it's open source, which is a little scary, but... Wait, the work you're doing is open source right now? So what our company excels in is two things. I mean, our overall charter is that, you know, we're going to... If someone wants to develop something, we're going to help them make it smaller, smarter, and safer. And we're going to accelerate that development. But we do that by being NDAA section, I think it's 848. I can't remember the number. Compliant, where we build everything in the U.S. Cool. Uh, Obviously, some of our subcomponents come from overseas. That's unavoidable. Yeah, um, but it, it sounds like that's very, um, you know, defense friendly. Exactly, and, and they're our biggest customers. Yeah, it um, makes sense. Why you'd want to help them out and, and make things that are, you know, repeatable for them. Yeah, so so that's uh, that's our um, that's one of our key things is that we make everything in the U.S. Um, and um, you know, we always make sure you know we know how to. Uh, use everything that we do. So we, we're able to actually develop these algorithms as well for our customers. So we're, if someone wants to develop you know, a drone application, the idea is that we're going to let them succeed in their mission, whatever they need to do. We make it flexible and friendly enough and usable enough so that they can use it the way they want to. But we're also not prohibiting another customer from doing their application, which could be different. And so we have a lot of flexibility built into our designs um, that allow a, a lot of different scenarios and use cases. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool that as a hardware designer, I get to see what this flexibility, you know, how do I design in flexibility is a whole challenge. And so that's always kind of an interesting part of my, my job is, you know, addressing all these different use cases. Yeah, I would imagine. Like, uh, can you give me an example of a time you've done that and, and sort of how it, how it panned out? Well, a perfect example um, is on our designs. We have these expansion connectors. Um, and what this expansion connector allows someone to do is buy another module, like an LTE modem or another kind of like a radio link specifically tuned for the, for government bands. And you can make them with our board. And now your, now your uh, compute platform has a radio link of your, of your choosing. Um, but at that expense is now a connector, which is cost and space. And I need to think in advance, you know, what signals need to go to that connector to support these 
unknown thousands of use cases that we haven't thought about yet. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and so what's interesting to see is how we have so many different customers that use our Voxel product in so many different ways. And it, it sometimes amazes me to think about how just a little bit of foresight and planning to provide from the get-go for flexibility, how, what that translates to and what someone's uh, kind of going back to that Elon Musk thing where we're not trying to constrain or hamper someone's creativity with our design. So we want to give them access um, to develop what they want. And then going back to the open source question, Very cool. um, outside of the core critical like drivers that are closed source, but because that's like, you know, that's Qualcomm and that's, you know, there's licenses, things of that nature, all the application layer stuff that if someone wants to develop on is usually open source. And we allow a lot of open source stuff to be run on our platforms. And so it kind of helps make, you know, so we address both that open source market. We have, you know, some customers may want closed source. Um, they want to develop their own stuff and that's fine. And then all of our stuff's, you know, made in the U.S. And so it, it, that's awesome. You know, we, that's kind of our, our marketing shtick. <laughs> I mean, know. there's not a lot of stuff that is these days anymore. So I feel like it's, it's refreshing and, and nice to see some, you know, a company that, that adheres to that. It makes sense given the defense market, the fact that that's the majority of your customer base, but at the same time, I mean, somebody who lives in the U S has grown up here, who does the majority of my work here. I mean, I don't know. It's, it makes you, it makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah. It does. And I think I mentioned on, on the first pod that I'm, I'm just, I'm a pretty proud American Patriot. I love my country. Um, you know, I, I just, I've always, you know, my dad was military. Um, I never served, but I kind of feel like I, I know you told me, but I yeah. just can I ask again to refresh my memory. What, what branch was he in? So he was Navy. Okay. You, um, you did mention yeah, this. Served, I remember it very well. Yeah. He served on the USS Saratoga in the cool. Mediterranean during the Vietnam era. And yeah. then he did reserves for 20 plus years. So he retired full Navy benefits. Badass. Um, and so just growing up with that, you know, involvement was always kind of, I appreciated that. And I feel like those Navy guys are always the best with radar. And I probably said this in our earlier episode, but every single person I've met who is an engineer and has also served in the Navy is an expert and a savant at, at understanding radar and knowing how to apply radar to a particular problem. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of former military engineers, both at Qualcomm and at Raytheon where I worked at, and you know they're determined to, to succeed. And I, yeah. and I think it's that determination that they have when they went into the military that it does follow them in their professional, you know, I'm thinking of a friend I can't mention right now who's who's doing some private military contracting. <laughs> it definitely follows them and, and yeah, please don't don't get anyone in trouble. <laughs> all of their life. <laughs> there was a there was a shooting competition I did one year and we were instructed explicitly no one is to take out their cameras and take photos of the competition during the show. There was only one guy who they hired to take photos for the entire competition and he knew who not to photograph. And like, and these guys had to kind of audit the photos afterwards to make sure they weren't seen. Like, so Interesting. I, I get some of these, yeah, I get some of these scenarios are pretty intense, you know? Oh, for um, sure. Um, but what's interesting is, yeah, I, I liked, I always enjoy even just being around military guys. You know, I yeah, for sure. Some, I agree. Um, there was a thing that my buddy got me into a number of years ago called Go Rock. What is and, it? go ruck go so rock go, okay so rock so, like like having a big backpack on like a rucksack exactly yeah and it was definitely a a life like it gives you a whole new perception on life to this company it's a company and they do they do two things they sell equipment like clothing so the backpacks shirts um weight lip, uh, stuff to like do workout with but the big thing is that they're ruck pack the rucksacks and they also are, they run events and, and their events, um, there's three levels of events and each event is run by what they call a cadre. And th this cadre was, is a former or in some cases even active um, special operator in one of the particular branches. Oh. And there's usually three or four of them at, at each event. And so they have events that are six, 12 and 24 hours long. And their premise is, you know, you're going to use their gear. You got to, you know, you got to wear a rucksack with weight in it to mimic, you know, a heavy load that a soldier would wear. And you're doing a lot of boot camp type 
drills and exercises like push-ups, burpees, you know, carrying logs. Burpees will kill you. I mean, like, yeah. I, I, carrying each other and then, yeah. like, you know, hiking for, like, you know, you know 10 miles, you know, all, you know, 12 hours all throughout the night and doing a lot of team building type exercises. And all these events are coordinated by these these ex special ops guys. And I'll tell you, cool. they will kick your ass like on the spot. But when the show, when when the when the event is over, these are the nicest guys you'll ever meet. <laughs> and they're just they're so humble. And yeah, of course. And their capabilities and their determination, and it's just it amazes me to to be around guys like that. That like the same. I feel like those people are masters of stoicism and of, of just, yeah. you know, mind over matter and, and of understanding, you know, like the objective is critical. This is what I need to do. You know, it doesn't matter what I'm feeling right now. You know, this is what needs to happen to, to get over there, you know? And so, and so I, I admire that. What's interesting was that, you know, I was right around when we were supposed to do our interview was around September 11th and I was thinking, okay, I'd, I'd be good to bring this into the conversation about how I actually did the, I did a GORUCK challenge, a 12 hour one. Holy crap. And so usually a lot of these challenges are centered around some theme. Um, so they have ones for like Memorial Day. They have ones for, to emulate the, um, like the Black Hawk Down scenario. They have ones around, um, you know, Independence Day. They have ones, you know, and so I did a 9-11 one. I did it five years ago when it was the 15th anniversary. And actually... And they usually hold them nationwide. You know, I've always done a lot of these in San Diego. But for this particular one, I felt it was important to go do it in New York. And so oh, that's York. cool. So, so I, I, I... Next time you go there, did, call me up. I'll, I'll, I'll well, I'm there. getting a little too old now. And, and yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I did the uh, GORUCK 9-11 challenge, the 12-hour one, in New York City for the 9-11 event. Badass. And what, was, what was really inspiring for that one was the owner, the, the, the head the, the guy at the start of the company, was the head cadre for this event um really great guy former ranger nice he was on the start of this company there was a ranger that's I, I don't mean to interrupt but i mean this person was such a supportive person to me when i was in a rough spot and and i mean what they learned is there, I, I don't want to get too into it but you know it's just to hear that makes me happy i'm, I'm sorry yeah. I, I mean to interrupt. No, no you're fine you're not you don't have to apologize to me um so I think what's, I, I, you know, we, we're going to keep cutting each other off. It's just the way we talk. <laughs> <laughs> we're too excited. Um, and I, I heard you mention this in other podcasts, how a lot of the mantra of like, you know, embrace the suck and it's, it's, you know, it's not about you and, you know, there's no I in team kind of stuff. And a lot of these mantras, you know, these guys lived it, you know? Yeah, of course. And, and, and go rock these challenges, try to take a civilian and just give them a taste and show them what is it like to rely on your team. They, they special design challenges that you have to do as a team or the whole team will fail. And a perfect example was this go rock 9-11 challenge that I did within the first 15 minutes, one of the first, so a lot of times, like, you know, you do a lot of individual stuff, like you'll hold, you know, you have to have at least a, like 20 something pounds in your rucksack and you gotta do, you gotta do rock. That's not too bad. Push shoulder presses and squats and you know all these different things one of the things they did in the, and this one probably had i've done 80. <laughs> yeah. oh the oh the worst was uh, i did a memorial day one where they had us do 150 uh, fuck me <laughs> 150 squats holding the rock and holy me. shit man that's crazy um so this one what was interesting was one of the the very beginning that we met in washington square park and there are about 50 of us that joined yeah. Now, normally these, these challenges by the end of the night, depending on whether it was a six, 12 or 24 hours, you can kind of predict how many people are going to drop out. And usually on the 12 hour one, you know, they lose like five to 8% of the people that started. Don't it's not too bad. Yeah. The 24 hour one, they usually lose like over 50% of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on this one, we did a, I don't know the technical term for it in the, in the, in the sports, like CrossFit world, but I call it a team push up. I call it, I call it a caterpillar push up. And the way it's structured is if you picture, it's easy to picture maybe like six or seven people in a circle. And if you are in a push up stance, but the person in front of you, their shoulder, their, their ankles are on your shoulders. And so on okay. and so forth. So the person in front of them, so your ankles are on the person behind you. Shoulders. So your hands are just on the ground, basically. So, 
when everyone does a proper push up, the only thing on the ground is everyone's hands. Okay. Everyone's feet is up on the other person's shoulders. Got and it. So you got it. And it's one of those things where if you do it all at once, it's a perfect synchronization of this ring or square, or whatever it is, of people going up and down, and all you see touching the ground are the hands. And so they tried to do <laughs> within the first fifty after we did the initial, they call it a welcome party, where you it's like the first hour is just brutal PT, physical training of yep. like, just to kind of get you to sweat, get you to start hurting, get you to be uncomfortable and in pain. Thank you. <laughs> and so by the, the way, like, I say thank you. It sounded dismissive. I meant it sincerely. Um, thank you for defining the acronym PT as physical oh, okay. training. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I think meant like, thank you, sir. May I have another kind of thank you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, just because you've been watching these, so I figured you, you've heard my peeves with acronyms. <laughs> so that's why I said thank you. <laughs> but I got it. Um, Both apply. So with, but anyway. In the first 15 minutes after they beat us up with some push-ups and some rucksack push, uh, uh, shoulder presses and squats and whatnot, we do this team caterpillar push-up and like 50-something people. So it's a massive Holy you know, crap. Of people in, in the middle of Washington Square Park in Manhattan. 12 and a half in every side of the square. It was not a, trust me, it was not a clean, it was like a, it was a zigzag, <laughs> people were avoiding garbage pails and light posts, and it was like a big Washington thing Square Park. <laughs> it looked like some kind of a, amoeba, if you looked at it from above, it probably looked like some kind of weird amoeba type shape. Awesome. And so we were trying to do this team push up, and we were failing miserably, and they were calling out people like, you need to push harder because you're making it harder on the next guy. And so sure enough, and we, I've done this one in a previous challenge and it was successful when it's like eight or nine people, you know, you can kind of easier who's failing and, and try to motivate them. But in this case, mm -hmm. when it was like 50, 60 people, it was a disaster. And what ended up happening was the guy in front of me wasn't going up properly. So he ended up putting more weight on my shoulders. And so as I was trying to do it out, do the push up, I eventually ended up blowing <gasps> my shoulder. Yeah. And yeah and you blew it out. Up my shoulder in the first 15 minutes of a 12 hour event. Fuck me, dude. I'm sorry. And I just basically collapsed and like my, my face hit the ground and I just kind of collapsed. And had I, this was not my first event, thankfully, because it, had this been my first event, I probably would have just called it and said, I got to go. I'm, I'm injured, whatever. I had, this was my third event in a culmination of these events where I had done previously, I had done a <coughs> Andre's retirement party. And then prior to that was the Memorial Day one, and each of them being 12 hours. And they taught me a lot about just keep fighting, keep going. Embrace the suck, you know. Important. We're not the only one feeling pain. Yep. You know, Amen it's to not that. about you. You know, you're here for a team reason. And I was able to keep pushing through. Badass. And actually complete this challenge. And they actually were really nice because there was, I think it was around two in the morning, we were doing a parade, like a promenade, two by two of all of us, of doing um, lunges, bear crawls, and crab walks across the Brooklyn Bridge. Nice. You know, like, That's a beautiful bridge. And they saw that I just cannot physically do a crab walk. That's where you are kind of like a reverse push up where your belly's up and you're using your hands and feet behind you to kind of like support yourself and just kind of walk. So because of my shoulder, the moment I even tried to get in that position, I just collapsed. I couldn't even, there was no pain. There was no like, ouch, it just collapsed. There was like no way physically I was going to be able to just like. That makes shoot. sense. You've got so a weak really actuator really trying to do something that it can't handle. Okay. I just, I was just there on the ground and I'm like, listen, I don't want to quit. What else can you have me do? And so what they did was they had me become one of the leaders of the whole promenade with another member and we were holding the flag in the front and just doing like squats, uh, 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 lunges across the bridge and stuff. <laughs> and setting the pace for the whole team behind us. It's like, as if we went too fast, they would hate us. Right. Yeah. But if we go, if we go too slow, then the cadre would yell at us. You're going too slow. So it's like, <laughs> Anyway, the, the whole reason why I brought this up was because of an earlier comment you made about how what's in, what's great was that they actually use, Golruck was actually, they list on some of the, if you talk to some of the cadres, they do custom events for corporate team building to do these types of punishment events effectively. People pay to be punished. <laughs> Yep, and, all the time. And I did. And I, There's I, big I, money in that on, under the bridge. Oh, I know. <laughs> and the great thing is I actually was able to apply like a lot of that no quit spirit, you know, embrace the suck, suck it up. It was amazing how I was able to apply that to my engineering world and my awesome. engineering life. 
to the point where um, one of my fundamental principles as a leader, where if, if I am, am asking someone to do something, it's only something that I myself would do as well. A hundred percent agree to that. Someone, I wouldn't ask someone to do something that I wouldn't do. Well, I'm the same way, right? So I have to be willing to do every single thing I would ask someone to do as, as a leader. And I mean, that, that applies to so many aspects of my life. Yeah. Um, I put myself through, you know, a lot of stuff to be able to, to say that, but I think that's important, right? I mean, if yeah. you're detached, I have, I have a buddy who I have lunch with about every month, who's a retired U S army colonel. And he always says to me, you know, like, um, if you're soft, nobody in your team is going to respect you. You know, if you don't live in the same, and I, I'm reading Rommel right now, I'm reading um, Infantry Attacks, which is the book he wrote in the First World War, where the Nazis hired him in the Second World War to be their, one of their field marshals. He was a lieutenant originally, and, I, and you know, I mean, I'm Jewish, but I realize that's not a PC thing to say. But this was a person that was very stoic, that you know was was a career soldier and that i don't think aligned with the nazi party i think it was more just you know like you know I, i'm a soldier this is what i do and i'm gonna do it and you know if this is my boss i guess i gotta deal with that you know yeah so and i i think that taking that attitude from you know former military members in the workplace is so huge because i recognized it more after i did a lot of these challenges through go rough where I was able to recognize in people, if they had that no quit, it's about the team, it's not about me attitude. And I remember so many times at some of my bigger companies I worked at where, like even if someone dropped like a screwdriver or a cable behind their desk, yeah. like, oh, I, gotta, I gotta call facilities. I'm like, call facilities you to, what? <laughs> to move the desk and I'm not gonna risk putting myself back there. And, I, and like, I just, I just under, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God. That's powerful. That? <laughs> and it's just like, what are you waiting for? Just do it. It's, it's yeah, like, get that fucking screwdriver and get on with your day. <laughs> <laughs> and I found myself. I do that too, by the way. Saying, just, just <laughs> screw it, get it done. And, and anytime we, you know, our company, we have a lot of new grads, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of young, fresh faces, eager, excited to learn. And, uh, I always tell them, listen, there's going to be stuff you're not going to want to do in your job. It's not, even though I love what I do, I don't get to do schematics every day. You know, I don't, I don't get to do lab view. I don't, I haven't done lab view in many years. I've, it makes sense, right? I mean, given your pay grade and, and what they get people to do that for, that's kind of how it goes, unfortunately. Yeah. But as you know, you, you have to, whether you're a startup or a medium sized established company or a 50 plus year old, you know, defense company i mean you you need to just accept the fact that you're gonna do stuff you don't want to do that's gonna suck it's gonna yep. be boring at times and Agreed. this is the same no matter what profession i think you have unless maybe you're a pure like banksy type artist or something like that yeah. <laughs> um, but even you know everyone's just cool in a different way <laughs> yeah you just it sucks in a different way and it's cool in a different way but you yeah. just need to get that stuff done and so i really i like working around for military folks I, I appreciate their mentality, what they bring. So many friends I've made are veterans in the last five years of my life. I mean, it, it, it increasingly so, I'll be honest. I mean, yeah. I have nothing but respect for what those people do. Yeah, so if, if any of your, your, your listeners really like, um, if they're into CrossFit or anything like that, um, check out these Gorok things. They're really, it's really, really bitching. Um, Send me a link after. <laughs> you got it. I remember when I first started doing this, it was... Um, I don't know if I mentioned on the first pod how I broke my neck and I had to have neck surgery. I don't think so. I um, could be wrong, but I don't think so. Long story short, around 2013 or so, I, I busted my neck. I had to get spine surgery. And then just through the process of my recovery, you know, I gained a lot of weight from that. Being yeah. Completely well, my dad's not the PS. I feel like I would have thought about that and mentioned that. Like, okay. Let me help you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't want to harp too much on it. The, the point I'm trying to make is that in my recovery, I found the best thing to start doing was I did a lot of hiking. And so my buddy, I was hiking with him a lot. We were doing these really cool trails around San Diego. And I would just carry like a little camel back with me. And then one day we were hiking this really tough hike in San Diego called Iron Mountain. Wow. And I made it to the top and he put down his, he was wearing a, a go rucksack and I didn't know it at the time. I was just wearing a camel back. 
and he put down his bag. And he's like, pick up my bag. And I'm like, why? He's like, just pick it up. I'm like, okay. I picked it up. I'm like, what the hell is this? He opened it up and showed me he had bricks in it. And I was like, <laughs> are you nuts? I'm like, what are you doing? What are you carrying bricks? He's like, yeah. I'm like, are you nuts carrying bricks in your backpack? He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not a backpack. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it's a rock. And this is part of it. He's like, try it. It'll increase your your uh, your exercise uh, ability. Like it'll increase the, your output. Like it's harder and it's it's a, it'll improve it improve your your recovery. And I'm like, I don't know. This is kind of crazy. And so what I started to do was actually started to take backpacks, like cheap hunting backpacks, and throw some like you know hand weights in there. Our and mutual friend like, Zang is really into that, by the way. He's invent. Was that? Andrew Zang has recommended that to me multiple times. Oh, yeah. Take a take a knapsack, put as many weights as you can fit into it. <laughs> Do your yeah. pull-ups, put with that on you. And I'll tell you, like, I was like, wow, this is tough. It really digs in. I was ma- I was making every excuse under the sun to like not do this, right? Because yeah. oh, it hurt. It, uh, you know, I'm not in good enough shape. And he's like, he's like, just and I was like, he's like, listen, he's like, go buy a Goruck bag, because they're designed to handle the weight. And put this thing in, and I'm like, what? he's like, I'm like, how much are they? He's like, I don't know, two, three, four hundred bucks. I'm like, what? Are you nuts? I'm not spending three hundred bucks on a backpack. fucking backpack, yeah. <laughs> and so after I destroyed three fifty dollar backpacks, <laughs> I was like, hmm. Statistics tells me I'm gonna blow up another one from Cabela's. That was only forty bucks. I already bought one, and the ones I broke, might as well just buy one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And, and that was my introduction into buy once, cry once. Um, How many more do you have to buy after that? Well, that one I still have. I mean, the thing I ended up <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, no, the thing is, it's it's a uh, in, in shooting. There's they call it, um, and I hope I'm not turning off some of your listeners. There's yeah, a term called uh, BRD, black rifle disease. Um, where once you get into things like ARs, you just, you, you love it. It's like, boy, it's like, it's like, it's like Legos for adults and you just get so absorbed. AR is totally Legos for adults. Yeah. And so the funny thing is, I just built two, I might add. (laughs) Um, with, I found myself with this whole Goruck thing, getting Goruck disease where I just, I had to get this backpack now. Oh, now I need one for my mountain biking. Oh, now I need one for travel. And now (laughs) Yeah, so so four rucksacks later. <laughs> Jesus fuck. Um, but I'll tell you, they they hold up, and so long back to the. the so you still have all of them. They're just for different purposes. Yeah, I, I still have them, and they still hold up. That's well. cool. You just hand clean them after you know get the sweat off, and they hold up, and they have lifetime guarantees. They will if they damage or you send it back, they will repair it for you. And if they can't repair it, they will replace it. That's awesome. And when I first was involved with them, everything they did was made in the USA. Um. Now they have some of the smaller accessories and stuff not done in the U.S. anymore. It kind of makes sense they, economically, you know, but they have to grow as a company. Yeah, they yeah. want to be more competitive, and you know they were getting a lot of competition a number of years ago, so they started to put some smaller stuff overseas. Uh, but when I was the first, when I first was a customer with them, everything was made in the U.S. And so all my rucksacks, you know, built in the U.S.A. Um, the, by the way, they, this is totally off topic and off color, but there's a South Park. Is that what we just do? Is that what go we're go fund yourself. And it's about a startup. I'm thinking, go rock yourself. <laughs> uh, well, one of my T-shirts I have says "Rock It," and if you look at it real fast, it's awesome. you know, so I like wearing that one out. And people take a double look, I'm like, "What does that shirt say?" <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, but I admire that. I mean, if you carry more stuff to the point where it hurts, and then you can handle it and get past that, it makes you a stronger and better person. And so yeah, I, and I think there's a powerful so, lesson there. It's improved everything. So now when I go hiking, I only hike with my ruck with weight in it. Even like if, you know, if I, if I haven't done it in months, I'll still, I'll, I'll just bring the weight down a little bit. Makes you know, it sense. really increases your, your leg strength and increases your calorie burn. Um, it makes, you know, it does make you a little bit tighter at first, but you get past it. But I think it's really helped. Um, and like I said, all those principles of just making you get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable is, is one of the other comments they say is that you need to get comfortable feeling uncomfortable when there's situations i've been in where like you know you i'm not going to go into what that is here but like you know you have to carry something that's more than you've ever carried over you know yeah. like you don't know how many miles and you know it's like it does make you a better person no <laughs> one, one of the one of the coolest um posts like a lot of times they have these events and it, they were always coordinated through facebook and you can see all the attendees and who's going 
And then after the events, a lot of the attendees would post photos. And then of course there'd be the necessary barrage of comments. And one of my favorite ones I thought was there was a husband wife couple and the husband was like a CrossFit, you know, bulky worked out, you know, you know, probably five, nine, five, 10, whatever, you know, good size guy, probably 200 plus pounds. And his wife was, you know, typical, like, you know, smaller stature, demeanor, you know, seems from a distance, like she, you know, she, you know, wouldn't hurt a fly type person. And during the event, they made her fireman carry him, which for your listeners that don't know what that is, is basically taking the person and slugging them over your shoulder. <laughs> where their butts, like, you know, their butts on on your shoulder and like their legs are hanging down and, their, and the heads, yeah, you know, you know, either way. And Badass. she she posted and they, someone caught that on photo. And this woman responded back to that comment being like, I would have never in my life have ever thought that I can carry my husband, you know, for half mom or whatever it was, if I ever needed to. It's like, it's like, it's, you know, put the situation, like it put them way out of their comfort zone and challenge them and they succeeded. And I think that's kind of cool that, you know. Badass. No, I completely agree. Yeah, this goes back to, again, like a lot of times we say how, you, you know, you never know what you're capable of doing until you try it. And like you said, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Well, exactly. A lot of it comes down to duress. Like, I mean, I know I do better if I feel like something's got to happen. Like, if I've got to make this deadline, if I need to be at this meeting, if I, somebody's depending on me, like, I will push the limits of my endurance to make it happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's a powerful thing for sure. And I just noticed, you know, as I get you know, more mature and older and into my profession and career and how all these things are intertwined. Like just the, the personality of like, don't quit, you know, do what it takes. You know, it's not just meant for, for, for work, the workplace, you know, I try to apply it, you know, like I mentioned before, I strive to be a really great family man. Um, you know, want to be good friends, you know, good, good to, you know, and just a good person overall. And I think a lot of these principles that we talk about um, apply globally in all these situations and it's kind of neat as i get older i see them play out differently and i think it's kind of cool um, i mean i i completely agree i mean i i, I think your way of looking at things i mean even from the last time we talked is is pretty you know goddamn cool i mean the fact that you can take an engineering mentality, apply that to your family life, and actually come up with something worth doing that I myself want to emulate. I mean, I don't know. I admire you, Vinny. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Hey, I admire what you do. I was telling, Thanks. um, I was telling one of my colleagues at work how you know you do this every week and you put out these things, and it's like I don't know how people have time for this. Like I don't know where you get the time. You're doing this on your free time. No one's paying you. That's You're right. doing this out of the love and joy of your heart. And to just do something cool. And I don't know where you find the time for it, and yet you still do it. And I think it'll pay dividends later on in life, hopefully. And I think that's pretty neat. Sometimes it does suck. I'll be honest, there's days when I don't want to do it. And it <laughs> maybe shows in the episodes. I hope it doesn't. But like, I mean, there's there's days when I'm 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 just so fucking exhausted. And I mean, I, I don't want to record an episode. Maybe I've gotten an hour of sleep. And, uh, you know, it's just like... And fucking do it. I don't want to blow off this commitment, you know, and you need at the end of the sleep. day, it's fun. What's that? You need more sleep. Probably. <laughs> you know what I find interesting, that comment you just made about not blowing off this commitment is how, uh, you know, individuals tend to cancel on themselves more than we would cancel on someone else. Same. Yeah. Well, not same. I do that. Like, you know, and especially like, for example, like someone dieting, right? Like, oh, I'm going to not eat ice cream today. And sure enough, you have a you know big can of, you know, Snickers, you know, ice cream, whatever. Yeah. But then like, if you're sure that's like, delicious you know, for people that are doing it, I myself am on a diet. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and then how, like, if, you know, we made a commitment, to, like the best thing, in fact, I was just my hiking buddy that I go hiking with all the time, Scott, we, uh, the one that got me into the Gora. Badass. Um, um He's, I think, 13 years older than me. And it's funny because, you know, I met him. We were talking how when I first met him, he was my age that I am now. Um, and he's like, man, you're an old man now. Cool. Um, but one of the things we were just talking about the other day is how I've never bailed on him if I said we're going to meet and we're going to rock. And regardless of the – obviously, San Diego, you don't have too many bad weather days. But and even if it drizzles a little bit, who cares? 
Um, yeah, that's right. And it's, and it's one of those things where like, we you know, you know, that morning, like if we're committed to like, we're going like there, there's, we've never bailed out on that. Yeah, I'm sure if it was pouring at this point, you would do it. I mean, you know, like, well, but yeah, exactly. I mean, like if we wake up with a headache, like we, I still go like, there have been a lot of times where he showed up and said, oh, I'm so tired. I got a, I got a headache or my leg hurts. And it's like, but you're still here. Right. And, and on the flip side, I'm like, yeah, I got a headache. I'm hungry. I'm not feeling well. I think I'm hungover. And it's like, but we're still, still here. here right? <laughs> it's, 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 obviously, yeah, if it was a complete storm and they closed the trails and yeah, we would obviously, okay, let's reschedule. All right. So you asked about the market. Um, and... Yeah, I was curious. Yeah, one thing we never talked about was investments. So I was curious, you know, do you ever do any of that stuff? Do you get into that? Honestly, my whole life I hadn't. Uh, and then March of last year, 2020, uh, which was the year of the Rona, I started to get into it. <laughs> and, uh, okay, the, the important question is, did you get in, you know, in early March or late March? Early March. I, I did a lot of stupid things. Well, I got in at the right time. I don't remember if it was early or late, but I got in at the, at the local minimum. And wow, I guess, you know, thank you. I, I got lucky. And so I um, never invested a dime. I was like, shit's on fire. This is the time. I, I probably should put some money in. And that's when I started learning. I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, if I had just put my money in the S&P and kept it there, I would have earned about 10% more than I did. Uh, but, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. I'm feeling that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what, what about you? What's, what's your stance and all that? I was just, yeah, I just figured it was something we never actually brought up before. But yeah, I, I above the mantra, the best market advice is to listen to me and do the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> the one that I've heard that I really like is buy when there's blood in the streets. Yeah, I like Warren Buffett's comment. Um, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. I like uh, that. And, and that was indicative of what you did is when you saw everyone was being fearful and the market dropped you hopefully that now is my time to get in yeah exactly yeah. um in 2018 when everyone and their grandkid made money in the stock market i somehow managed to lose money <laughs> it was i mean to, to to go back and stuff though it's easy to do what i did as a novice it's hard to do what i did now that i've been doing it for a little bit right and when I say a little bit, I literally mean like a year and a half, but um, it's it's much more difficult to apply that kind of discipline as an insider than it is to do it as a total outsider. Yeah. One, one of the best things I did was when my wife and I moved back to San Diego and she was about to give birth, I was like, I don't want to deal with the stress of managing, you know, our, you know, IRAs and all these accounts. I'm like, I was going to go get a financial advisor. And it was the best thing I ever did was I got a guy at Edward Jones. Nice. I just hired not, a guy not, myself. Not to, plug, not to plug Edward Jones, but my particular advisor is awesome. And uh, it was like the best Edward thing Jones, you said? Yeah. Is that the name of the firm that your advisor works for or the name of your advisor in particular? The firm, yeah. It's, it's okay, a, it's I'm an idiot. You'll, you'll probably, now I said that, you'll probably notice the commercials. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, they're a nationwide My guy works for Prudential, firm. but yeah. I mean, you, you, they're a nationwide firm, like an HR block, but they focus on, you know, investments and, and, uh, my guy's really good. And it just made, made me sleep better at night. Um, cause I was getting into um, options a lot. One of, oh, my, ouch. one of my other friends that I started hiking with a lot, he was kind of teaching me about options and I decided to try it on my own. That's a scary prospect. And that, yeah. And it was that typical, uh, gambling scenario where I, I started off doing great, making a lot of money. And then, so what do you do? You increase your bet, right? Yeah, of course. And then what happens when you increase your bet? <laughs> exactly. My brother is, uh, he studied finance. And, and when I started getting into this stuff, he said, don't get a gambling addiction. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> it's definitely true. Because I I got a gambling addiction. I mean, I was having, I had all my money in all kinds of crypto. And I didn't get into options. I, I, I. I don't want to say I knew enough to knew, but I, I was cautious enough not to get involved in that. I was like, I'm fucking stupid. I, I don't know enough to really understand puts and calls. I'm not going to get into options trading. I'm too fucking dumb. Like, I, I don't want to get involved in that world. I will lose all my money. 
Uh, and that was, I mean, it's maybe a bit of a defeatist mantra, but that was, that was kind of what I told myself. And that's what kept me away from that world. No, you're, you're better off because it is, you know, I was I'm probably, again, one of the few that lost money on cryptos. <laughs> I, you and me both, to be honest. Yeah. I got in at that peak of 20, uh, end of 2017 when like Bitcoin hit its first like 20 K point. Yep. And I was playing, I was playing with the non Bitcoin alternatives, like the, the altcoins, I guess they were. I got into that as well. And just, I don't know how it works out, but everything I, I buy would just crash. And ah, I shit, I'm sorry. Around, it took, I spent like two years slowly re recovering it back. And I noticed that like just the movements, there's no correlation between reality and well, it's like these dicks that think the Fibonacci sequence has something to do with their earnings. And it's like, yeah. you're a superstitious fucking asshole. You know, it's yeah. like that has nothing to do with it. Or, or the fact that some superstar or like an Elon Musk person can yeah. put up a tweet and move the whole market yeah. one way or the other. It's just like, I, I, I can't do that. I, I, I got to just give it to my finance guy. Stop it. Focus back. I have one buddy that I worked with at SpaceX. He was co-interns with me and he made about 60 grand on the Shiba Inu coin. He had $200 invested Wow! <laughs> when Dogecoin took off me and a buddy in NASA uh, had made like a pact where we each put $500 into Dogecoin. And so I pulled out 4,000 and paid for some nice. stuff I needed to pay for at the time. And I think he probably did similarly. Thank you. I appreciate that. But my, my one buddy, Bob had put his money to shit and I still want to get him on this podcast, but he's, um, just hasn't done it yet. And, um, he put about $200 into, into Shiba Inu coin. And he made like 60 grand. Nice. <laughs> yeah. It's, those unicorns are, and like, he referred to it as he called it that stupid Shiba Inu coin. <laughs> yeah. When you make a boat, ton, uh, a boatload of money on it, you can call it stupid. <laughs> I think that was it. Right. Um, yeah. So I just, I'm, there was one stock that I liked that I've been playing with. It was a penny stock at first on the PC, and then they rolled into the NASDAQ. So I thought, oh, this is great. They're going to NASDAQ. They're uplisting. This is going to be great. And it's just been kind of like tanking ever since. Ever I'm sorry. Ever since, uh... But it's actually really, it's a pretty neat company, a pretty neat technology. Um, what is I'm it? I'm hoping they'll take off. Uh, it's a company called Versus Systems. They do, they started off with, um, they introduced, um, video game competitions where you can win, win real world prizes. Cool. Uh, so for instance, and HP has it in their, their, their system. So like a bunch of people around the world can play like a challenge, like a Mario Kart, let's say, Cool. or, or, or shoot them up game. And like awesome. whoever gets the yeah. highest points or the most laps can win a real prize. Like they'll get like a, a, a coupon or, or a redemption code or something. And they were, pink sheets for a long time and then they uplisted to nasdaq and once they uplisted to nasdaq they bought another company have you ever been to a ballpark or a concert lately where they have how, these how recently they have these interactive things on the billboards like a hat shuffle game or guess the guess the crowd attendance or, i haven't seen that yet so they have this thing that they call it there's this it's and i don't think this is the only company that does it but there's this concept called the second screen experience where even if you're watching television, like a live sports game, let's say, yeah. where you're at a concert or you're at some ball game, you can log in on your device and they have like live trivia questions or challenges. Like one of like you can do like a hat shuffle game and pick the hat that the ball is under, or you can do, awesome. like, ski like you know, ski ball, who can get the most points in ski ball or, or hoops. Wait, game during game. like a fucking football game or something? During an actual live <laughs> and, and you're hilarious. competing against everyone else that's there in the stands yeah, yeah, yeah and then they can show who the winner is and then those people can like win real prizes and stuff and it's, it's kind of cool and so this company is they they that's all their technology awesome and so it's kind of cool so i'm hoping that one takes off because i have that could to be honest i i think the way people are wired i mean we want to you know still feel involved even if we're kind of zoned out and so i think that could work yeah it's difficult to know for sure but i mean it, it just intuitively it seems viable yeah, I mean, who knows? It's a, uh, it's one of those things where I just, the more I think about the market, the the, the more I realize how bad I did. <laughs> <laughs> Stop doing it and have my advisor. I even I I, get, I transferred those to my advisor and said, don't sell them. Just I just want to hold on to them. And 
I'm thinking, I'm hoping this is our million dollar opportunity, the uniform one, but it's just like slowly, slowly, slowly. You know? <laughs> but the good thing, it was, it was all pre-marriage money, right? So as long as it's all pre-marriage money, you know. Your wife's not going to be pissed at you. Mad. Yeah, my wife can't get too mad at me. You can't say, you lost all um, money. I have one friend and she was telling me that she was putting a quarter of her paycheck into Bitcoin. And I'm like, why are you doing that? <laughs> You know, like, what are you thinking? I guess she just likes being paid three fourths of her going right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way I see that. I, you're talking to a guy that has three bitcoins that I bought at twenty dollars each in the early two thousands. Yeah. Where I lost the password to the account. And so, oh my god! Yeah. No, you didn't. I did. And so I, um, I'll never see that money, but it's probably worth, what is it, like 50, 60K? It was, I think, 41 or 42 today. Yeah, so, you know, 120 grand that I, I theoretically have, but I'm never going to own, and some Russian probably already has claimed by now. <laughs> oh, my God, that's awful. I, oh, man, I'd be, like, scared. My net loss is $60. I'm not that mad. <laughs> True, but, yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah, there was this one other... Um, and I, and I know penny stocks are stupid and foolish when you're throwing your money away, but there was there's there's ones that have done well that have got like I think Gazprom was one that I I get into that did all right. It was like a Russian pipeline company, and then there was another one that was it was a Delaware Holdings company that controlled some oil and gas resource, and, and they just exploded and they made good money. I, I haven't gotten fucked on penny stock yet. I'm sure I could. So you have you heard of um NFT, the, these non fungible tokens? Yeah, with respect to like uh, someone's like copyrighted work or whatever, they can kind of tag it to know that it's genuine or not, even though it's a digital copy. And nobody really cares. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I, I found this one company. They were point zero 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 one cents per share, <laughs> and they were claiming they were going to try and do this, and I'm like, well. How cool would it be to own a million shares of something? <laughs> and it cost me a hundred bucks. Nice. So you know what? Why not own two million, right? Bucks, no big deal. I spend. Yeah, that's that's that's. I money. feel like that's a that's a fucking investment, right? You put in two hundred dollars. Yeah. You're like, even if I lose it all, who cares? Yeah. It's two hundred dollars. Yeah. And so I had this company in my portfolio, probably close to a year, and it did nothing. It just sat there. You know, some days it would be, you know, down to, to, up to 0 0.2, 0 0.1, whatever, toggle a little bit. And I decided, you know, I'm, I'm liquidating everything. I'm giving it to my advisor. Let me just sell it all out. Just give him everything. Been there. About three months after I sold it all, they announced some partnership with this like really like fancy artist and NFT thing. Their stock went to 0 0.018. <laughs> now, for those that didn't realize, maybe, I mean, I might have spoke the digits incorrectly. But it was an uh, eighteen thousand fold increase. <laughs> and if so you had a dollar, you would have made eighteen grand. Like it was to the point where my two hundred dollars had I just waited three more months would have been worth. I think I calculated it to be a, and, and again my numbers might be wrong, around thirty six thousand dollars. Okay, eighteen hundred probably I would think. Or. I might have, I may have been off in the decimal point. Maybe it was like point one. I forget what the, but I, I know when I looked at the history and I'm like, I could be wrong too. Yeah. I'm like, I had to go tell my wife and I'm like, yeah, we could have had like 36 grand from 200 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Think of my buddy that put in 200 and made like fucking 60 on Shibu Inu. <laughs> no, you know who made the money is like E-Trade because they always make money in their transaction fees. So they made the money. I got my 200 back. I sold it at basically the same price I bought in for it, but. The only one that made money there was E-Trade. They always make money. Genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was my that was like my final nail in the coffin to just stop it with that. Yeah, it makes sense. Focus back on work. I, I'm the same way. So I, I was spending in, in like April of 2020, maybe like uh, five, six, ten hours a day on just trading in addition to running projects for SKA. And at a certain point, I just wanted to kill myself because I was burning so many daylight hours on, on this trading stuff. It was, I was sleep deprived. I was, you know, I, I was suffering in my day job and, um, you know, I mean, I, I had to stop. And so that was when I was 
that's when I developed a mentality of just buy stuff and hold it. You think it's going to do well. Yeah. It's, um, when I was into options, I would get up before the market. And so San Diego market opens 630 here. And I created these very elaborate spreadsheets to track all my investments. You have to like when they're, when they're going to release what the movement could be based on when they're going to announce earnings and all this. And it's, and it was a time game because options expire and it was so stressful. And like I said, I, I got to the point you. where I started off making money, but then it got to the point where I was getting in too deep and I was managing too many and I just couldn't keep track of them all. And I had options in um, uh, one company that I think I put like 400 into it. They were worth 32 grand. And I thought they were going to um, come out with blow in earnings and they ended up getting killed on the earnings. And that 32 grand went back down to like a thousand dollars. And I'm just like, <laughs> so you made 600 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I held it more thinking they might come back and then they ended up expiring ah shit that's horrible <laughs> i'm sorry uh, so i did know. stuff like that right where like I, I put money into things and i just i bought thc stocks when when biden first was elected and they went up 50 percent uh it was it was some etf that was just all the weed stocks and um if i just sold when it was up and, and i did have a gut instinct that was like sell it sell it sell it this this doesn't make sense nobody could explain to you why it's gone up in a way that seems sustainable fucking sell it you know and that was that was basically my mentality but at the same time you know it was just like you know this is exciting i mean i probably as a future it's never been legal before there's an opportunity for a new market to take hold you know maybe this will do well and so I, I held it and I lost everything. I mean, it just, well, I didn't lose everything. It just went back to below where I had it before. And I, I lost a little bit, but I could have earned a hell of a lot. So that's why it's like, I'm glad, like now I just have this advisor. They don't do options. You know, they just do the buy and hold strategy and you know, then move some stuff around. It's a better strategy. Yeah. And I'm hoping that versus systems stock will eventually turn around because I'm I really think they have some good, got some good stuff. So have you been yeah. tracking Velodyne lately? Velodyne? Yeah. No. They basically invented LIDAR. And so, oh, okay. like, uh, like the laser equivalent radar for our listeners. Right. Yeah. And so David Hall, uh, uh, who's their was their CEO is the, um, he was in DARPA grand challenges. Um, and his company, uh, or I guess his, his teams had like a LIDAR that nobody else had for the first few challenges. And um, eventually they productized, it became Velodyne. The original Google cars before um, Waymo came out with that dome that you'll see in the Bay Area yeah, nice. was using the a Velodyne 64HE, which was that UFO looking thing. Um, I guess you'll, Uber was using Velodyne 64HEs uh, Argo and Aurora used the Velodyne VLP-16, which is the puck. It kind of looks like a hockey puck that you'll see, and there's sometimes two of them mounted at an angle. And um, I bought a bunch of their stock, and I sold it, and they've just been tanking and tanking and tanking. And I don't know what the exact uh, logic is, but like David Hall's basically been in a fight with his board, and him and his wife were the majority shareholders, but they've just been getting disparaged and besmirched and, and to me that one's interesting because it, it's when i bought it it was like 50 dollars a share it's down to 16 and i'm just like i'm wondering like should i get back in like you know it's it's tanked yeah. pretty good you know and i'm just like ah, i don't know well again because I, I, like know, if you look at the news it's a snafu the but then you wonder like is some dick trying to deflate the share price so they can get in and they'll go back up you know you don't know yeah, I can give you the best advice to do and then just do the opposite of it. I think it'll work out for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny is it's it's funny you mentioned uh, LIDAR because what's interesting, I mean, on my company, my industry, um, that's kind of the one sensor that like drones have been missing. And what we try to do as a technology company is bring in as many other possible sensors, the cameras, you know, barometers, uh, inertial motion units, like IMUs, um, you know, and different types of cameras, you know, IR camera, thermal camera, even like a, what they call these range finders, like either ultrasonic or um, IR projector. And they yep. can reflect back and tell you distance, kind of like a radar. Like a 1D. 
like a common well those can be extrapolated to, or interpolated to 3d maybe i'm using the wrong word but yeah yeah Sorry, yeah, it depends on, yeah if you're a drone obviously you're trying to understand your 3d space uh, if you're a ground robot you probably only care about the two-dimensional just the distance but what's funny is that like i think what's happening fundamentally is when we first started doing drones like now this is coming up on seven or so years ago that i first started getting into it everyone kind of unanimously agreed that like oh you a lidar is going to be the best sensor you can get for yeah. mapping but they're bulky expensive you know who's going to buy all these lidars and so the technological challenge for for drones and, and sensory applications is to effectively not no longer need a lidar and and we're converging on that point where i think lidar is going to become irrelevant for a lot of applications that it was promised to be useful for um now you can interpret that as saying sell <laughs> <laughs> yep which means buy <laughs> i get then, that you know you never so like you know like for instance our you know our new platform our rb5 flight platform that we announced with qualcomm uh, we have so many sensors on that freaking thing and we have ultrasonic sensors on there we have what's called time of flight sensors that use yep. ir projectors we have uh, six cameras, some of them black and white, some of them, you know, color. Uh, the, all these things just to try to perceive where it's at. Nice. And to observe other things around it. So, so that, you know, a, a, someone can complete some mission with it, whether it be inspection or security or, you know, carrying a small payload you know, for drone, you know, drone deliveries, like, you know, medicines and stuff. Yeah. Food, Uber Eats. <laughs> And it's funny, like Amazon, yeah. <laughs> take your pick. Yeah. Which it's funny. We actually just said Amazon just announced their Ring drone, um, which we knew about back in Qualcomm that we weren't allowed to tell anyone about. But now that they publicly announced it, um, where it's it's a little drone that stays in your house to do kind of on the spot security. Like say oh, you're at work, you go, oh, I want to know who's at the front door, but you don't have a camera at your front door. You can send the drone to go check out your front door. That's cool. The drone go back. Or oh, did I leave the stove on? You can fly the drone to go check out your stove and then confirm and then bring it back. That's so awesome. We're saying that, 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 that would actually help a company like us because we can actually do those applications um, and help someone else get there. So it's kind of cool to see all that come together. So I think, anyway, long story short, I don't think LiDAR is going to be the, uh, the center that it, it is necessary. Like you don't necessarily always need LiDAR. If the software exceeds the, um, the hardware, I mean, that's definitely the case, right? I mean, LiDAR is a pure hardware solution where it's intrinsically yeah. valuable, uh, but it relies on expensive stuff. You got to keep buying over and over and over again. Uh, and if you can do it with cameras, you're saving a buttload of money for sure. And and the payload capabilities, I mean, those things were bulky and heavy, but I know there's been a lot of companies that came out trying to do LiDAR and, and smaller LiDARs. And now they basically do single point, like that uh, that other sensor I mentioned, Time of flight. basically like a single point laser effectively yeah you know, as opposed to a lidar which can put a pattern out all around it you know a lot of competitors now are just putting out single point and if you're and i mean i've designed time of flights into robots <laughs> they're awesome yeah and you you know if, if you only care about information in one direction you don't need a lidar right correct and and if you're some and if you're a robot that can turn well, now your single point of direction information changes anyway. So again, you don't need the LIDAR. You coupled with an IMU. Yeah. What's that? It said coupled with an inertial measurement unit. Yeah. 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 So anyway, so yeah, you can interpret that as a cell. <laughs> Who knows? You could also interpret that as a buy if you're doing the opposite of what you say to do. Which, but did I already know that I'm going to tell you the opposite or? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, touche, touche. Uh, anyway, cool. So, should should we cut it? I feel like we're we're at like a good a good point where yeah. we've, we've covered a lot of interesting yeah, sounds good. Time. Sounds good. Sweet. Yeah, let's uh, let's um, let's keep in touch. A anything you want to plug, by the way, in the meantime that, that you've been trying to talk about on here uh, before I before I kill it? Yeah, definitely. You know, my my company, Model AI. Um, anyone looking to do any kind of robotic or a drone application, you know, we're going to help make accelerate that development, you know, smaller, smarter. Why make it yourself and you can buy off the shelf? Yeah. A lot of our customers, you know, if 
you know, they just use us right out of the box and put us in their application. Uh, and then some other customers use this as a development stone, a development jump to their final milestone. You know, it, it works different ways, you know, and, and we can accommodate, you know, and any, any, any requests. We also do custom design work as well. A lot of our customers, uh, we do custom design work for them just because not many people understand the Qualcomm stuff. If you're outside of Qualcomm, it's very difficult. Um, it makes sense. I, I mean, you guys have been putting millions of dollars into this and, and just developing. Yeah, I mean, when I, when, I, when I worked there, I mean, there are teams and teams of engineers that would support like a Samsung or an Apple or whatever. And, and you know, who can afford that? Who, who can afford to go pay Qualcomm, you know, $50 million to help them with their, you know, their uh, artificial intelligence application? You know, it's not going to happen. They're not going to care, you know, but, you know, that's where we kind of come in and fill that, fill that gap. Awesome. So, kind of cool stuff. So excited about our future, excited about what we can do. I think what's also pretty neat is our CEO in our company just won a San Diego uh, top tech award. Nice. Tech of the future last week. And they, and they pointed out to all our hardware and our capabilities. That was kind of a, a good moment for our company where we won this top tech award for San Diego. And as director of hardware, especially. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 They showed a lot of images of the, of the hardware and I'm like, that's my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, team effort, team effort. As I mentioned earlier, it's all about the team. Definitely is, but at the same time, I mean, you've got to, you know, enjoy that as well. I mean, as somebody that that ran that team and is, I'll, I'll happily take the credit where it's given. Yeah. <laughs> but every, as I mentioned before, every good leader also knows where to take responsibility. Amen to that. I completely agree. Awesome. Well, Vinny, thank you for coming on. I appreciate you. You're awesome, and uh, we should do this again. Uh, we, we'll schedule one right after this. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Definitely. And keep in touch. Let me know. Um... I know there were some things you mentioned to email you about afterwards. Just you know, shoot me a text reminder. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.